It's my distinct honor to welcome you to this special public forum with renowned award-winning political strategists, thought leaders, and media commentators, Donna Brazil and Ana Navarro. This event is sponsored by the Tommy G. Thompson Center on Public Leadership and hosted by UWM at Waukesha. My name is Simon Bronner, and I'm the Dean of the College of General Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee that includes this wonderful campus in Waukesha, established in 1966, the Washington County campus, and first year bridge program at the Milwaukee campus. This presentation is in line with the college's outreach mission of civic engagement with our communities on issues of public concern and providing ample opportunities both inside and outside the classroom for learning and participatory experiences toward building a civil society. I want to especially thank this locale of Waukesha, and we're also honored to have tonight with us the mayor of Waukesha, Sean Riley. I also want to be sure to recognize leaders from the college who brought it to fruition. Kristen Feckety is Assistant Dean for Finance and Administration. Courtney O'Connell is our Assistant Dean for Student Affairs. Dr. Ron Galat is our Campus Administrator as well as an outstanding Professor of Sociology. And Tricia Cortzell is our executive assistant. In addition, tonight you'll see assistance from many of our world-class faculty, staff, and students. I draw your attention to the programs you receive to our future events on matters of public interest, all free and open to the community. Also, take a look at the information on the Washington Seminar this summer that we sponsor furthering civic engagement of our future government leaders. Tonight's presentation has attracted great interest from both our institution and outside of it, and it will be live streamed. Let me share a few housekeeping notes. Please take a moment to silence or turn off your cell phones and refrain from flash photography. After remarks by our distinguished speakers in discussion with me, you will have a chance to ask questions either through the microphones or from the questions that you write down on cards that I will read. If our students can collect them from you who have written them down, I'd appreciate that. Please wait for staff members to provide you with a microphone so your question can be heard on the recording. We've been happy to work with the Tom, Tommy G. Thompson Center on Public Leadership for several years, and we're delighted to work closely with Associate Director Ruth Brash to bring this event to you. Ruth. <laughs> to give you more of an idea of the center's important work, I want to introduce you to its director. Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Dr. Alexander Tak. He holds a PhD in political science from Stanford University and is an expert on American judicial politics. His work has been featured in Public Opinion Quarterly, Political Analysis, and American Political Science Review. Please welcome Dr. Tak. Thank you, Dean Bronner, and good evening. I, I am Alex Dock, the director of the Tommy G. Thompson Center on Public Leadership, uh, and we're really delighted to be able to sponsor tonight's event uh, and bring Donna and Anna uh, here to UWM Waukesha and work uh, with Dean Bronner and everybody here who uh, it's always a pleasure to work with. So I want to thank everybody here and everybody at the Thompson Center, uh, especially Ruth, for making this event possible. Uh, let me briefly explain what the Thompson Center is for those who may be unfamiliar with it. 
The Thompson Center was founded to follow in the footsteps of Governor Tommy Thompson, who proudly worked with colleagues on both sides of the aisle to advance the public good. In seeking to carry on Governor Thompson's legacy, the Thompson Center works to foster effective public leadership by offering public events such as this one, funding research and scholarships, and conducting other activities across the UW system. Tonight's event features Donna Brazil, former chair of the Democratic Par uh, Party, and Republican strategist Anna Navarro. Despite hailing from opposite parties, these pundits join forces to speak truth to power and provide honest, blunt, and humorous commentary on the American political landscape. It's now my pleasure to uh, introduce or reintroduce Simon Bronner, Dean of the College of General Studies and Distinguished Professor of Social Sciences at UW-Milwaukee. Uh, Dean Bronner has degrees in political science and American studies from Binghamton University and Indiana University, where he was a Rockefeller Foundation Fellow. He has taught at Harvard, Penn State, uh, Leiden University in the Netherlands, and Osaka University in Japan. He is the author and editor of over 40 books on American cultural, ethnic, and political history and sociology, including most recently, Americanness, Inquiries into the Thought and Culture of the United States, Youth Cultures in America, and Explaining Traditions, Folk Behavior, and Modern Culture. He has also written for major national newspapers, including the New York Times, Philadelphia Inquirer, and Forward. His recent research is on the political and cultural effects of globalization, with two forthcoming titles of Americanization, Inquiries into the Culture of the United States and the World, and the World of Tradition. Thank you, Dean Bronner. Thank you, Dr. Tuck. Let me now introduce our featured speakers for tonight's forum on elections and the American presidency, past, present, and future. Donna Brazil is a renowned political strategist, New York Times bestselling and author, an Emmy and Peabody Award winning media commentator, actor, and Georgetown University professor. I want to point out to our students who are here too that participate in our college's TRIO program, but I also found out that Ms. Brazil was in a TRIO Upward Bound program and started on her career path in presidential campaigns while a student at Louisiana State University. She later was a fellow at the Institute of Politics at Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government. She became the first African-American woman to serve as manager of a major party's presidential campaign, running the campaign of former Vice President Al Gore. She previously served as interim chair of the Democratic National Committee and the DNC's Voting Rights Institute. She's the author of the 2004 best-selling memoir, Cooking with Grease, Stirring the Pots in American Politics, and the new 2017 New York Times bestseller, Hacks, the inside story of the break-ins and breakdowns that put Donald Trump in the White House. She's the co-author of For Colored Girls Who Have Considered Politics, which won the 2019 NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Literary Work in Nonfiction. She serves as an adjunct professor in the Women and Gender Studies Department at Georgetown University and served as the King Endowed Chair in Public Policy at Howard University and as a fellow of the Institute of Politics at Harvard Kennedy School. She's the proud recipient of more than 10 honorary doctorate degrees from major colleges and universities, including her alma mater, Louisiana State University. In October 2017, Donna Brazil was the recipient of the W.E.B. Du Bois Medal, Harvard's highest honor in African American studies. Ms. Brazil was the recipient, too, of a Daytime Emmy Award for Outstanding Daytime Program, Good Morning America, in connection with her work with ABC. And she was a member of the Peabody Award-winning Best Political Team on Television on CNN during the 2008 election cycle. Ms. Brazil. Oh. 
either end. I told you she was an actor. Yes, I am. Ana Navarro was educated at the University of Miami and holds the JD degree from St. Thomas University School of Law. She served in a number of Republican administrations, including the transition team for Florida Governor Jeb Bush in 1998, as well as serving as his director of immigration policy. She also served as ambassador to the United Nations Commission on Human Rights. She later served as the national co-chair of the Hispanic Advisory Council for John McCain in 2008 and John Huntsman Jr. in 2012. In February 2014, she became a political commentator for ABC News. In addition, she's also the political commentator on CNN. Navarro became a contributor on the ABC daytime talk show, The View, from July 2013 to August 2018. She joined the series as a weekly guest co-host on November 2nd, 2018, and was named the permanent co-host of The View on August 4th, 2022. She received daytime Emmy Award nominations for Outstanding Informative Talk Show Host in 2020 and 2022. Please welcome Ana Navarro. And Cha Cha. You're over here. You're, you're fine. I'm a dog lover. I, just, I miss my girl. She's at home watching the house. I just told her don't go in the refrigerator because that's mama's beer. <laughs> Zara loves beer. I didn't know that. When I, you know, uh, tomorrow. Zara loves beer? Yeah. That's I think that's a problem, Donna. No, it's not. Look, when I adopted her, she rescued me. And it was uh, four years ago during the beginning of COVID. And I said, I, I don't want to be alone. And then I said, I don't really want to talk to people either. Uh, so I went out and got a dog. Uh, and Zora, I brought her home. And this was at the time when they're looking at your house to make sure everything is up to code. And I brought her outside thinking she needed to use the restroom, right? And I had a cold beer on my patio table. And she jumped up and started drinking. And I said, I'm keeping this dog. I think that dog may be from Wisconsin. <laughs> oh. I, 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 said, I said to Anna, when I saw Cha-Cha, I said, Zora's going to be really mad that she wasn't able to come and enjoy this great weather uh, with some of the, the country's most wonderful people. And I say that uh, as a Southerner, but knowing so much about your state history, and of course, spending so much time here, especially <clears throat> during presidential years. <laughs> and I want to thank you for having us here. Uh, we've had a great two days in Wisconsin. We've seen a lot of this state in the last two days. Feel like I've driven all over uh, the place. Thank you for letting me uh, bring Cha Cha. She really does go everywhere um, except the White House, because they've got some crazy ass German shepherds there. <laughs> who. I think would look at her as an appetizer and I'm a little concerned about it. And really her only qualification that she asks for in a president is, will he or she like dogs? Yes. Well, let me begin. Which means she's voting for Biden. <laughs> <laughs> Simon, are you okay? Yes. <laughs> I mean, you're such a um, prolific writer and I mean, your accolades and all of the research and papers you've developed, you know, I, I did a deep dive. Oh. And let me tell you, um, if I was a student on this campus, I would take your class. Thank you. And Thank I, you. I hope you're giving the students here some good grades because you're yeah. passing on some wonderful information. You're we, awesome. Thank you. We have great students and they're anxious to learn from you as well as the community. Let me start with a general question since 
you're veterans of many elections. Oh my God, that's synonym for old, but go ahead. <laughs> remember when we were young? Wait, do you remember when we were the youngest people in the room? I remember. I yeah. don't, it was so long ago. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. The rhetoric of election integrity is filling the airwaves and speeches. Is there a problem and how should we resolve it? Well, that's a great, good question, a, a wonderful question. In 2020, uh, before that election, I asked myself what was the, you know, what was the most important thing I should be doing? And I decided along with the former chair of the RNC, Michael Steele, to join this organization, the National Council on Election Integrity. It's made up of former members of Congress, former House and Senate members, as well as governors, uh, former election officials, uh, Secretary of State, and from this great state, I think you all have three members, uh, Russ Feingold, uh, Dave Obey, uh, Steve Gunderson, and Mr. Ripple, Reed Ripple. So it's bipartisan. And we decided to put our party labels and our partisanship aside because the integrity of the election was being called into question. It's like attacking the refs before the games. Our job was to try to uh, assist the American people in learning how to go about uh, conducting an election during a, a pandemic. Now, I don't know about Anna, I can speak for myself. I wasn't around for the, the last pandemic in the 19, uh, early 1900s. And so, um, I mean, as you all know, states had to come up with new guidelines in terms of absentee balloting, uh, drop boxes, uh, there were a lot of things, and we wanted to educate the American people, not to take positions or take sides, although we, we all had our preferences, but we thought the credibility and the integrity of our elections mattered above all else. We've continued to meet long after January 6th, uh, working with, with members of Congress to uh, you know, get funding for local election officials, to ensure that we have the best run uh, elections across not just the United States, but all over the world. And I'm sure you all know this, over four billion people are voting this year, four billion in democracies. Now, we are, we're not alone in, in ensuring that we have the very best election administration system. And most Americans don't know that by law, states must maintain their ballots and integrity of the process for almost two years after the election. Most people don't know that there are recount laws in practically 46 of the 50 states and the District of Columbia. So we need to learn as much as we can about what's on the ballot, not just the candidates, but also the issues. We need to educate each other. We need to protect our election workers. They should, no one should be threatened simply because they are, you know, helping to administer, uh, administer the election. So there's a lot of work we should do, but the integrity of our elections start at the local level and, of course, the state level, but it also begins with each and every one of us taking our civic responsibility at heart. We are a representative democracy, which means that the people decide, not the politicians, not the political parties, and we should play a role in that process. So. Well, let, let's hold I'll, the I'll, questions I'll answer for that. Later. I'll answer that. Don't you worry. I'm looking right at you, baby. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. Miss Navarro's got something to say. Um, and I'm going to get Yeah, so about election integrity, I would say there's, there's two things. One is perception, and one is reality. And in politics, perception is, is, is almost as important as reality. And there is no doubt that there is a segment of the American public who think, who still think, uh, that, the ele that the last elections were not fair and legitimate. They're wrong, but they still think that, and it's very hard to argue against that. Then what's the, so that's the perception. And I think there's a general malaise and a general skepticism in America right now uh, on the trustworthiness of our institutions. It's not just elections, right? It's Congress. It's the administrations, it's schools, it's media, it's so many different institutions. That is part of it. 
I also think, look, I think for one party, the strategy is how do we get less people to vote? Less young people, less black people, less brown people. The other party is how do we get more people to vote? Um, I, I do think that some of the questions around election integrity and that narrative that Donald Trump, frankly, and the Republicans have amplified tremendously came back to hurt them. It probably cost them the state of Georgia. Uh, it's, it cost them mail-in balloting. People, repo when I was growing up in Florida, Republicans dominated mail-in balloting. They just dominated. We all knew that Democrats were gonna show up at the polls, but the uh, Republicans were gonna win when all the ballots were counted on election day because it was gonna be the absentee ballots that won it for Republicans. That's turned around completely because there's been so many questions created around absentee balloting, a, a lot of them illegitimate questions. There's definitely an election integrity problem when you have court cases going on right now about folks trying to overturn the elections. There's definitely an election integrity problem when you have two ballot workers, two poll workers in Georgia whose lives were threatened, endangered, and ruined those women have post-traumatic stress syndrome for the rest of their lives simply because they were doing a civic duty and being poll workers. That's, that's, that's terrible. And there's election integrity issues when the entire world saw America's elections try to be overturned. Things that we're only used to seeing in places like Cuba and Nicaragua and Venezuela and North Korea, but not in Washington, D.C. That couldn't possibly be happened. So I do think uh, there's perception, there's reality, and there's what we should hope for. And what we need to do is all, as Donna says, we need to be educated, engaged, vigilant, and we need to vote. But you know, issue one is an organization that helped to create the National Council on Election Integrity. And, we have a website, but more importantly, with all of the members of Congress, former members, including my ex-boss, I have so many ex-bosses, thank God they were bosses and not husbands, because someone would think differently of me. <laughs> uh, but Dick Gephardt is a part of it. Um, um, and, if, you and had, it if you had three spouses, you might be a good candidate for a Republican nominee. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I see where this is going. I'm gonna be careful now. Monogamy ain't what it used to be. I'm speechless. <laughs> um, Bill Clinton was just a little ahead of his time. <laughs> now nah, I am definitely going to plead the fifth. Uh, but you know, as someone who started my career, um, you know, organizing kids in my neighborhood to get their parents to register and vote because we wanted a playground. That was a simple proposition. It was following the death and assassination of Martin Luther King that we had a city council race and I said, I'm gonna get involved in this race because the candidate said he would build a playground in our neighborhood. Remember back then, the South was segregated by race and also by class. And so if you lived on one side of the train track, you had several playgrounds in which we were allowed to go and play, but there were no playgrounds in our uh, section of town, and we live so close to the Mississippi River that every time it rained, we had waterfront property. Um, <laughs> so we, we were able to organize kids to tell their parents, you gotta register to vote. This is five years after the passage of the Voting Rights Act. Five years. And it took us months to convince people that it was safe, listen to me, safe to vote, that their lives would not be threatened as American citizens if they registered and participated in the electoral process. It took an act of courage, and the courage, of course, of men and women of the civil rights uh, movement, those who fought for freedom and equality for all. So <clears throat> this notion that somehow or another people are perpetuating a fraud. Perpetuate. I, by the way, I'm the uh, English as a second language speaker here. 
and Spanish is my second language, and asked me to speak it. Uh, <clears throat> the more tequila she consumes, the better her Spanish gets. Thank you. That's true. And give me a glass of wine, I can probably speak three other languages. Um, but no, one, no American, I mean, th this notion of fraud is a small matter. Yes, we should not have any fraud in our electoral process. But the notion that you are going to file lawsuit after lawsuit, which has happened in several states across this country, blue, red, purple, and in between, they're trying to purge people, saying that they're dead people on the roads. Well, you know what? There's a solution for that. Get, help states perform their electoral tasks after every election, okay? But don't, you know, take on this, this enormous task of removing people's name from the ballot so that when they show up on election day, they have to prove that they're John Doe or Jane Doe. And in some states, you know, it costs so much money to get the form of ID that is required. I thought we eliminated the poll tax. And yet, we're telling people that they have to have several different forms of ID. Give me one ID, I'll take that but not several different forms. And why is the cheapest form of ID a gun license? And the most expensive one is a driver's license. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, if you believe in democracy, then the right to vote should be on the top of your list. Every American, every citizen should have the right to vote. That is what we fought for. That is what the Constitution of the United States when it says, and it spells it out very clearly, our individual rights, our freedoms, they must be protected. And so the National Council of Election Integrity is really about educating not just the American people, the citizens, but also the Congress. The turnover in Congress has been just, it's been dramatic. And it hasn't helped, the, it hasn't helped in any case, when you see these extremes, as we were driving here uh, from Stevens Point, I looked at you know, my little Twitter thing just popped up, X, and Marjorie Taylor Greene, she's going after the speaker. Now, I don't agree with the speaker on a lot of issues. The only thing I agree, he went to LSU, so he must, he must be decent. <laughs> I mean, I'm a proud LSU graduate, I mean, you know. Uh, but she's trying to remove the speaker. This will become the second speaker removed. And you know how long it will take for them to get their act together with a one vote majority? One seat. So no, the integrity of our elections are very important, but the election workers and the people who volunteer to serve at the polling places, they should also be protected. Congress should fund to ensure that we have uh, adequate resources for election administration, and yes, and the state house, the state assembly, which is up here in Wisconsin, they should also make this a priority to protect the elections in our country. And you know, um, I really can't say enough just how much this has harmed our image across the world. You've participated in delegations with the National Democratic Institute. I've participated in voter uh, election observation uh, delegations with the Institute of uh, the International Republican Institute. Those countries that we used to go observe as folks, as American folks who came with the, the strength of our elections and our democracy and our justice system, those countries are now laughing at us and saying, wait, you all are gonna send folks to observe our elections? And a lot of that is just absolutely false created narratives that don't exist, but that have harmed our image and our standing inside our country and outside our country. And I say they're false because there was court case after court case after court case brought, and in every single case, it was found to be false. Do this because she likes to read. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you about another piece of rhetoric filling the airwaves, and that is the dissatisfaction with the choices of president around fit, whether it's age, character, or other attributes. Having worked with 
presidential candidates, who or what do you think marks fit for someone to take the highest office in the land and perhaps the world? Well, I think there's three types of fitness, right? At least for me. One is character, uh, values, principles, truth-telling, honesty, decency, humanity. So those are values. Then there's mental acuity, and then there's physical fitness. Look, I, I think um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt showed that you can have, you cannot be, you don't, you don't have to be a marathon runner to be president of the United States. Probably running for president requires more energy than being president uh, once you're there. Um, so the two guys we have running. The age issue. That's one I don't understand, and I'll tell you why I don't understand it, because they're both old. <laughs> I mean, they really are both old. But if they went to the same. But, 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 but the only one that seems to be being held to his age is Joe Biden. And frankly, you know, like, okay, so Joe Biden fell off a bike. Did you all see when he fell off a bike? He was on a bike. <laughs> I mean, the man was at least yeah. on a bike, right? The other guy's on a golf cart. So it's like, I mean, I, like, I, I think to myself, okay, you wanna measure fitness, why don't we put both of them on a treadmill and the one that's still alive in November is the one <laughs> that's gonna be uh, precedent. Um, the truth is, you know, Joe Biden, I was telling Donna this, Joe Biden looks old. That's what happens when you don't spend hours and hours a day trying to primp your hair and, and spray tan yourself. You know, you know something you should, you should recommend a spray tan. I thought about that, maybe grow some hair and look like Mick Jagger <laughs> or Harrison Ford. That's what um, I, was, I was telling her yesterday, I think the Biden campaign should have a, a, an ad where they bring out Martha Stewart, 81 years old, Sports Illustrated swimsuit model. Mick Jagger, 81 years old, touring the world. Harrison Ford, Indiana Jones. They can even bring out Al Pacino and Robert De Niro, new baby daddies. That's true. There's a lot you can still do at 81. And don't, I don't want to get into what my daddy was doing at 81, but let me just tell you, he was happy. Girl, and, my he, daddy's uh, 83 and he's happy and I'm not. <laughs> I'm not happy that he's happy. My daddy had an AM and a PM girlfriend. We had to make an appointment to see him. <laughs> so I tell people, if you want to talk to me about an 80-year-old man, please, I can tell you a lot of great stories. Um, so I, I think the American people have to uh, answer that question for themselves. And, you know, we have to, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of over this idea that we don't like either of them. Well, you know, there's some times in life where you have to choose uh, who's the best, not the lesser of two evils, the best of the choices, right? Like, have you ever been to a wedding yes. and you've got to choose between rubber chicken or rubber salmon? Okay, well, you know, there's some things in life that are binary choices. I just think a lot of people these days think, you know, it's like a Starbucks. Okay, I want a venti with, okay, you have six types of milk to choose from, you have four t sizes, to choose from 12 different types of sweeteners. No, we've got two candidates to choose from. And I think people have to answer for themselves who they think is most fit mentally, physically, and definitely in terms of human, hu humanity and decency. And look, uh, the only age requirement in the Constitution by law is you have to be 35. So they're double that, okay? Um, <laughs> I'm not one of those double haters. Uh, in 2020, that phrase was coined by millions of Americans who didn't like either one. They didn't want to park in, in the red parking lot or the blue parking lot. Uh, but when election day came around, they decided to park the majority of them in the blue parking lot. There are now polls that indicate that <clears throat> they may stay home. They may not vote. Many of them are young. They are unaffiliated. 
and they don't like their choices. I tell my young nieces and nephews all the time. I say, look, you may not like the two candidates, but you have to decide. You have to choose. The, there are a lot of things on the ballot. And not just president, but the, as you all know, control of Congress and a lot of important down ballot races and ballot initiatives. And after what happened in Arizona today, I told, hey, I might learn how to, how to you don't know what happened in Arizona? The Supreme Court of Arizona upheld a law from 1864. That's 160 years ago when the state wasn't, when Arizona wasn't even a state. That's right. When women couldn't vote, when African Americans couldn't vote, when the Civil War was going on, as you reminded me today. And it is uh, a pretty much a total ban on abortions without so much as a, uh, exception for race or uh, rape or incest. So that's where things are in Arizona. In 14 days that goes into effect, a nearly total ban on all abortions, including those resulting from rape and incest. And Arizona is not the only state in this country that will likely have a ballot initiative on abortion. Florida will likely have one. Maryland will likely have one. We might see uh, abortion uh, ballot initiatives in several other northeastern states. So we, we have to really pay close attention to our elections. And, but when it comes to who leads our country, yeah, um, I'm happy that Joe Biden is leading our country. I make no, you know, um, there's nothing controversial. I, I, I love Joe Biden. In fact, I've known Joe Biden longer than I've known most politicians in this country. Joe Biden offered me a job soon after the Jackson campaign and in 1984, I was 25 years old. And he said, why don't you come work for me? And I said, I might. Dick Gephardt came along and he, paid, he offered me a position that paid more. Uh, <laughs> but the president and I have remained friends and just a few weeks ago, I went over to the White House for the St. Patrick Day uh, luncheon. I'm, I'm black Irish. Uh, black Catholic Irish, a and the president put me at a table with eight priests and a Kennedy. <laughs> I said, I guess he was trying to keep me from, you know, enjoying myself in the afternoon. I said, and I looked around and said, y'all know I'm about to sin, and I ordered myself some wine. So, no, he, he's sharp. He is, I mean, you all probably saw him at the State of Union on March 7th. I mean, not only did he give a great wonderful address to the nation, but he stayed, took selfies. He knew how to use the selfie machine, and some of the people half his age was like trying to, he's like, nope, got this. No, look, I mean, look, the horse race is not just about a candidate's age, uh, but his, his qualification, his fitness to do the job, but also his record. And I think we should also judge the president on all of those various merits, and not simply uh, condemn him for living so long. Look, as a black woman, y'all seen the actuarial tables, right? Shh, let me get to be 80 or 81. I'm gonna show y'all what it's like to dance. I'm gonna show you what it's like to garden, and I'm gonna keep running my mouth. I, you know, I think people need to do a, a compare and contrast, and uh, yes, I'm Republican, I've been a Republican my entire life, I'm a registered Republican, I vote in Republican primaries, but I'm not voting for Donald Trump. And for me, the choice is 81 years old or 88 counts. <laughs> I mean, this is, and I, I think Joe Biden, despite his age, despite having a very difficult makeup in the Senate and in the House, has been one of the most consequential successful in terms of legislative accomplishment, hard legislative accomplishments, the CHIPS Act, lowering diabetic drugs, uh, infrastructure, I mean, so many accomplishments with a very difficult makeup. And so I, and it's because of the experience he has uh, brought to this. I've also known Joe Biden for many years, not as long as Donna, but I've known him for probably about 20, 25 years um, when we were on opposing camps. And the man's a decent man. And you know, for me right now, I'm a one issue voter. I want a president who says the truth. Yeah. Yeah. Well. 
That's a lead in to a more local question, but one for you as political analysts, I, I think that we would be interested in hearing. You're speaking tonight in a state that is designated by the media as a battleground and in a locale, the suburbs, and particularly women and Hispanics in the suburbs, considered the critical voting demographic that's likely to swing the present and future elections. They are the purplest of the purple areas of the country. How and why have the suburbs ascended to this position, and what do you think will sway this demographic? Well, first of all, I, I, I do believe that every state is a battleground state, but of course, um, being involved in politics, you have to make your mark. And this election, like the last two elections, will come down to a handful of states, possibly five, six states, uh, and this is considered to be one of the swingiest of the swing states. So you all are going to get a lot of attention. Uh, I, I called the White House on Monday morning when I was you know, heading to the airport. I said, um, is, is there any room on the, on the plane? I'm heading to Madison, too. Uh, and they said, well, why didn't you call last week when we announced it? And I said, I wasn't thinking about this. Um, but no, you, you will see a lot of the president, vice president, surrogates, and everybody else. And, and the targets are not just uh, the urban centers in any of these battleground states. It's the suburbs. You got to go where the meat is. You got to go where there, where there are a lot of undecided voters. And the voters that we need will have to be persuaded. Uh, the targets are not just college-educated voters, they're working-class voters, they're voters from all walks of life, but the target of persuasion comes down to voters who often um, switch sides, or the number two target are what we call voters who only show up in, in presidential years but not non-presidential years. So they may need a little bit more, more uh, motivation. But yes, you are a huge target, not just at the presidential level, but as you all know, your Senate uh, race is also going to determine the balance of power. Uh, so look, I hope you look forward to not seeing a lot of the opening days of the NFL because there will be a lot of ads. And not, not all of the ads will be sponsored by the RNC or the DNC. There will be a lot of dark money ads. Uh, dark money is not money that comes from black people. Uh, <laughs> it's money that, that flows in our political system without a trace. It goes through nonprofits. It goes through other um, institutions. And they don't, have to, they don't have to identify their donors or sponsors. You'll just hear on the radio that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris don't like white people. I said, what? what? She's married to, and he is, I couldn't figure that one out. But that app is playing already. And, and, and so remember, if you're a battleground state, just like you, you know, act, act as if you're like Iowa, New Hampshire. You're going to set a tone, and you're going to send a message to the country. Take this very seriously. Get the candidates involved. Get their campaigns involved. Get their surrogates involved. If you want to know about where they stand on a certain issue, tell them that you want to do a town hall meeting. Bring them to campus. You know, tell them you want to meet them at the union hall. Wherever you decide that you want to meet these candidates, they should come to you. They should tell you their vision and what they hope to accomplish and what they've done with the time that they, they had in office but you are going to be very, very special. So get used to seeing me too. <laughs> well, you know, when I, was, um, when I was growing up in Florida until, what, until maybe 12 years ago, we were a swing state. Um, in fact, when I was a young kid, all, these, uh, all the statewide elected officials were Democrats. Then it became a purple state, a swing state, and now we've got Ron DeSantis. Um, and it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a quite a red state. Um, I have to tell you, I miss being a swinger. <laughs> it's fun being from a swing state because the amount of attention you get, the relevancy you have, the uh, amount of times people show up to listen to your priorities and your needs and the things that you're 
thinking about, it's funny how much they care about everything in your state, about your potholes and your, you know, when, when you are a swing state, not so much when you're not. And so, uh, so I think it's, it's a unique opportunity for you as engaged citizens and for the people of Wisconsin to really make sure that you are heard and you are seen and you are taken into consideration. You asked about women. Listen, I, I think this uh, abortion rights, reproductive rights issue uh, is affecting and really having, uh, having, I think it's having influence and influencing all women and men, you know, women and their allies, even if you don't live in Alabama, even if you don't live in Florida, even if you don't live in Arizona, because I think this idea um, that your children, your daughters are gonna have less rights than your mother. I think this idea that so many laws are being made mostly by men who seem to have an incredible low understanding of a woman's reproductive system. I've now gone, thought to myself, in political science, they need to sh uh, teach biology. Because when you're ruling against, you know, when you're making rulings that are affecting IVF, it just, and that, that ruling in Alabama put into evidence such lack of understanding. And I think Republicans, you know, for so long, for 50 years, we've been hearing about the abortion issue and overturning Roe v. Wade. But it was this thing that I think a lot of people thought was an empty threat and really was never going to happen. Uh, yes, it was used to get people to the polls, it was used to get donations, but I don't think it was something that, that was real, right? Most people didn't think it's real. Well, it's real now. It's real now. And, uh, and you're going to see women having to travel all over the place. You're gonna continue hearing the horror stories that we've already heard, right? The 10-year-old rape victim. The woman in Florida having to carry the child without kidneys to term because the doctors were afraid to perform a, a procedure. The women with cancer, and men with cancer, who can't do IVF now, or who are afraid of IVF because of what they're gonna, what's gonna happen with the frozen embryos. I mean, all of those different things that we are seeing day to day, that we are hearing the stories. I don't, you know, when I hear the story of the woman in Texas, that to me, does not feel far away. That to me is a woman in distress who's being told by government instead of by her conscience, by her priest and by her doctor what she should be doing. And I find that deeply offensive. Even though my ovaries are shriveled, I find it deeply offensive. And I, I think and hope most women will stand in solidarity with each other and just be offended by the idea that we are being dictated to and that this is no longer a, uh, that this is putting lives at risk. This is putting real lives at risk. I mean, what, what's the slogan now? Can you imagine a law from 1864? Make America 1864 again? I mean, it's, it's, it's insane. It's absolutely insane to be taken back 160 years in terms of rights. Amen. Well, since you're both referring to issues in a campaign, and you both have been involved with political campaigns and managed a campaign, I'm wondering if you can... I've only been involved in losing once. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wonder if you can share your reflections on the process and the criticism that campaigns are too long, too expensive, and too nasty. And they don't deal sufficiently with issues. Is that the state of our electoral process, or is that where we are now? Well, I mean, so I have 10 presidential campaigns, 55 congressional, that's House and Senate, 19 state and local campaigns. I've worked in 49 states. One more state, I'll become Miss USA without the bikini. <laughs> 
And I have to tell you, and it's not a reflection of my age, it's just a reflection of the nature of our politics. I enjoyed every moment of my career uh, being on the campaign trail, living out the suitcase, uh, helping elect men and women of valor, courage. I've always picked my candidates based on my values, uh, based on the issues that I care about. Uh, based on the fact that I believe that they would serve the community well or serve the country well. And so I am really uh, miffed at the nature of our political campaigns and the coverage. You know, once upon a time, you actually had debates. You had conversations. Uh, you traveled the country from this place to that place to the other place to try to talk to as many people as possible, to get your issues out there, to tell people where you stand on health care, on the environment, education, foreign policy, whatever it might be. And nowadays, you know what you, you get? I get this on TV, the horse race. Joe is leading by three, Donald's leading by two. I'm like, we're not talking to people anymore. We're not educating people about you know, whether it's the climate or, or whether it's education or, I mean, look, I am very interested in knowing with, with almost a trillion dollars of our federal funds going toward the military, how much of that money is going toward educating people about the need to serve and about educating those who are in the military so that when they're finished with their service, they have a skill or a trade or a job to go to. I don't like this notion that when they finish their service, then they have no job, they have no life, no future. My dad was a veteran. I care deeply about our country and, and, the, and, and our veterans. And yet we don't talk about what's in the budget. We don't talk about the solvency of several programs or whether or not we need to continue to have these programs for the next 30 or 40 years. It's always about the horse race or in the case of Congress, will they come back from recess? You ever know, they go on recess more than ever went on recess during my school years. They're on recess, and when they come back, they're gonna deal with the budget because we got five days before the government shut down. We are a world superpower. So I wish we could go back to the old days where yes, we did have a long campaign season, but it was about debating the issues. It was about having an agenda, having a platform, something that the Republican Party failed to do and 2016 and 2020, um, are we gonna have a future where our democracy is thriving? And I think a lot of that depends on the quality of the candidates, but the two political parties, the two major old political parties need to also figure out after this election cycle, what will it take to open the doors of both parties to the vast majority of American people because the vast majority of Americans are no longer Democrats or Republicans. They're unaffiliated. They don't care about either one of us. So we have a lot of work to do. Is it long? Yes. Is it nasty? Absolutely. I never got offended when somebody called me a name because back in the day I would call them a name back. Uh, but now that's all you do is name calling, okay? Uh, but the amount of money, I was able to get Al Gore within 537 votes of the White House. We don't want to talk about Florida today because we know that's a problem. Um, <laughs> But I was able to do it with less than $150 million. Nowadays, we're gonna spend upwards of $16 billion on our elections. It's an industry, the, the po politics is an industry. And, and what they're doing is dividing us. They look at you and they say, okay, I'm gonna target you, but you, I'm gonna ice you out. And you, well, maybe, perhaps, but they might wanna get more information. We. We take so many people for granted. We, we look at our ones and forget our twos and ignore the threes. Ones, I'm definitely gonna vote for Joe Biden. Two, I'm not gonna vote for Joe Biden. Three, I don't know. I mean, we have to do a better job in politics and that's something that those of us who've been political professionals will have to sit at the table and start figuring out what the future of our democracy look like when we're not talking about a upcoming presidential election in 209 days. I, you know, I also think um, part of the answer to this question, your question about uh, elections being long, expensive, and nasty, is, um, is this particular election feels really long because we've had no primaries, practically, right? 
the Republican primary was like living in parallel universes. People, there was a few people running against each other, and here was Gulliver in the land of the Lily Pushins. Um, Joy Behar told me the other day I, I was saying that wrong. How do you say Lily Pushins in English? Lily Putins. Lily Putins. Okay, in Spanish you say Lily Putiense. Um, <laughs> Then, so, you know, and on the Democratic side, we've had no primary. So we haven't had the excitement of, of primary nights, the uh, excitement of debates. We haven't had people showing up at the early states and, and, you know, pressing flesh and visiting with voters. We haven't had any of that in this because both sides basically have a presumptive nominee. Both sides have an incumbent. It's a very weird election. Uh, frankly, Donald Trump is not doing much campaigning. Most of his campaigning is being done from courtrooms. That's what he considers a campaign appearance, showing up in court. So I guess he is doing a lot of campaigning. <laughs> um, and so I, you know, I, I, think, um, I think that's why this feels so long. And what I am very worried about is what Donna was talking about, that dark money and the super PACs. I think those super PACs are, have had such a negative impact on our elections because candidates can claim to have no connection, to have no idea of what uh, the super PACs are doing and have no fault in what they're doing. And so the super PACs often do things that are really dirty. And one of the things that bothers me tremendously is, is when people try to win by suppressing the vote by trying to get people not to show up to vote instead of trying to win more votes. And that, I think, is also a, a very uh, negative thing. But it's where we are. Um, it's what, you know, you all are not gonna feel that like there's no excitement because you're gonna have it over and over and over again here in, uh, in, in Wisconsin. But I think this particular election is bringing all of that out. Oh, and then we've got, RFK. <laughs> yep. Well, let me. Jill Stein. Um, I mean, the Libertarian Party. I mean, no labels uh, failed. They did not get a candidate uh, or candidates to run. So, yeah, we will likely have uh, Carnell West, um, Jill Stein, and Robert F. Kennedy Jr., uh, who already is telling people he's going to be a spoiler. So. Well, since you raised the issue of how we vote, there's also controversy, as you know, about mail-in voting, the possibility of internet voting here in the state of Wisconsin, about drop boxes. What is the future of voting? No longer are we using the phrase in the ballot box, right? Because we're talking about diversifying in all kinds of ways, and yet there's also a counter movement to, as, as you mentioned, suppress some of those means of doing it. What do you advocate for, or what do you see as the future of voting, particularly with the internet revolution? Well, I, I have not come out, although my ex-boss inspired the invention of the internet, uh, the <laughs> Super Information Highway, Al Gore had a large role in that, and I watched every moment of it. And it was very intriguing to see how the internet would now come to, you know, control or in some cases ruin our lives. I keep getting these notifications. I don't know if you get them. Oh, your social usage is down. I'm like, what? Why are you talking to me, Siri? It's like she wants me to get back on my iPad. I'm like, I'm not having a relationship with you, Siri. Um, Siri never understands a word I say. <laughs> never, ever. I end up in, you know, screaming at her. You know who I am having a good relationship with, though? Chat. Chat GPT? I, I, I don't want Chat GPT in my life. Oh, you they want said Chat? They try to, apparently AI, which is another unknown factor in this election cycle. And we've never had that before. You know, look. I go back to the days when I had a, a Rolodex or a legal pad uh, on a clipboard. And I went door to door and I knew everybody in the neighborhood. 
and I knew everybody that I had to make contact with before election day. Now, election day is no longer election day, it's election month. Election, you know, it feels like six weeks in some states. Uh, in some states, the, the laws are, are quite liberal. Everybody gets a ballot, and it's up to you uh, to turn your ballot in. Then there are states where uh, you can, you know, in D.C., for example, I can bring my ballot to a Dropbox location, which is the public library, which I consider to be safe. So I don't mind dropping it off versus going all the way downtown. And, and the problem with having one day to vote is that most Americans are working. And that's why we began to try to extend the amount of time people can vote, two weeks before the election or four weeks, uh, extend various ways to get your ballot. You can get a, and, you know, a, a non-excuse absent ballot. What's wrong with these? Uh, inventions that will help us cast our ballot. I, I'm not convinced the internet uh, currently is safe enough. Uh, and there are enough safeguards with the internet in terms of the integrity of that process. Uh, but that those studies are underway now. And military voting is one way that they're you know examining is it safe? Can we look at this you know down the road? But we're I'm a totally against this. I guess I can say it here, and I hope you all expect me to say it, because I'm a Southerner. I mean, my parents didn't get the right to vote. My grandparents they served in the military, my, my father and you know my uncles, and yet they came home from their service, four bronze stars in Korea, a UN Medal for Valor. They came home with Purple Hearts from Korea, and as well as uh, Vietnam, World War II, World War I, no right to vote. So when, when it did happen, I watched them cry. And so I vowed as a little girl that this is what I would do with my life. I would make sure every American would have access to the ballot box. It made such a huge difference seeing grown people watching them trot out the house to go and vote and come back and show us that they voted. I couldn't wait to turn 18. I couldn't wait to vote. We should not take that right away from citizens simply because we're afraid that they may vote for someone else. We should give every American the right to vote and to have that vote counted. That is what a democracy is all about. You know, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I, um, I f my family uh, fled Nicaragua after there was a communist revolution, after a civil war. So I came here uh, in, uh, in 1980 as an eight-year-old girl. And um, there's nothing that brings home more the importance of voting and being engaged and the importance of democracy and the importance of voting than actually having seen people lose the right to vote and living with people who've lost that right to vote, being, living with people who fled dictatorships. That makes it real, right? And I think, I think and hope that for Americans, the message came through after January 6th that our democracy is not something that should be taken for granted ever. It's something that needs to be preserved and defended and looked at as sacred. And for me, I think we need to make it as easy as possible for the most amount of people to vote fairly, legitimately, and with integrity. Like Donna, I don't think the internet is a place, I don't, you know, I don't want internet voting. But I, what I don't understand is on on absentee ballots, on you know, mail-in ballots. Every time I buy anything on Amazon, which is daily, <laughs> you know, I don't think I told you this. So I, I, uh, I was at Jeff Bezos, one of his houses in uh, Washington. He did this event, and they were uh, nice and nice enough to invite me. So I met Jeff Bezos, and I asked him for a sharpie. And he said, what, what do you need to sign? And I said, one of your bricks. Because I've bought so much stuff on Amazon, I think I deserve 
This is the very least I deserve. But the point is, why can I track my Amazon package of when it leaves the warehouse, when it's out for delivery, and why can't we track our mail-in ballots? Why can't we have scan codes and barcodes that tell us where our ballots are and that we can follow them and have that kind of assuredness? I don't understand how we can have better track of my, you know, peanut butter pretzels from Amazon than we can of our, of our ballot. And it's because we haven't, it's frankly because we haven't made it a priority. It's because people don't want to. It's because some states simply don't want to make mail-in ballot easy because they're afraid of the results. So we're not voting, we're not, you know, we're not making laws with the idea of how do we make elections better. We're making law, people who are making these laws at, at the state level are making the laws with how, what laws do we need to pass so that we keep winning elections? That's the problem. You both have referred to your youthful experiences becoming engaged in politics. It's that a damn shaped miracle your we career. remember. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to refer since we're on a college campus, to youth engagement today. The Harvard Institute of Politics, with which you're familiar, has come out with a poll that's been publicized showing that less than a third of 18 to 29 year olds are attracted to public service. And less than 20% are engaged with public policy. Is that a problem of today? Uh, how do we get youth and our future leaders more engaged with some of the issues that you've named? And when you look at those studies, um, there was one, I think about two weeks ago, it was in the Washington Post or USA Today. I read five or six newspapers a day. It's at the end of the news, at the end of the day, I, I can't remember where I got it from, but I know I read it. And it was a study on, on the world's happiness. Did you see that? Yeah, we, and, were, we, 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 we were no longer yeah, we're not happy. on the yeah, top of the. So I, when I saw that, I started digging. I said, well, why are we so sad? And it was a Wednesday. And so I decided to go to class that day. I, tomorrow, I, I, when I leave here tomorrow morning, I go back, I teach on Wednesdays at Georgetown. So two weeks ago, I said to my students, are you all happy? <laughs> what gives you hope? I, and they were so downbeat. I took out my iPad and I started playing some Motown songs. <laughs> I'm like, you know, back when the Supremes, you know, and you know, Lionel Richie and and, and Stevie Wonder, isn't she lovely? The Did they know who those people were? No. <laughs> no. I had to go back to Taylor Swift and Beyonce. I was, so there's a, there's a Netflix documentary on right now called uh, about the making of We Are the World. And I was talking, thank you for clapping. I was talking about it the other day to my stepkids Mm -hmm. Not a single one of them had heard of the song. I, 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 I disowned them on the spot. <laughs> I told them they got to go make their own damn money because I'm not leaving them a cent. They're that ignorant. And, and, and one of the projects of We Are the World for the United States was Hands Across America. Yep. And I was the uh, East Coast director. I got involved. Service, as the Honorable Shirley Chisholm once said, is the rent we pay for living on this planet. I am now the chair of the J, well, the Fulbright Foreign Scholarship Board. And we encourage young people all over this country, especially um, at our colleges and universities, as well as teachers and other scholars, to go study abroad. And so I tell my students, I said, guys, you are, this is your moment, seize it. And I tell my students, why you? Because there's no one better. Why now? Because tomorrow's not soon enough. I say, I, I left this country at the age of 19. I went to Helsinki, Finland. No one told me it was cold as you know what. <laughs> I mean, Wisconsin, it will give you all a run for your, your winters. 
And but it opened my eyes to the world. A UN conference, youth conference on peace, detente, and disarmament that was back in the day, of course. And I tell them, you should be applying for everything. You're young. You don't have, I mean, come on, you don't have a lot of responsibilities yet. I know some of you do, but do it. Get out. Go learn the world. Learn a new language. Do something. And then come back and bitch. <laughs> <laughs> when you're like me, you got to pay taxes. And every time my property taxes go up, I say, now, what is the age when you all cut it off or I pay half? I'm becoming a conservative as I get old. <laughs> um, but when I said, you got wings, use them. This country is in dire need of leaders. Only 4% of our fellow citizens actually run for office. And while I have never run for office, I have, I have served. I served on the Louisiana Recovery uh, Commission soon after Hurricane Katrina. I did that for five years. <clears throat> Just recently, I served on the mayor's task force during co coronavirus. But there are ways to serve, and we need to encourage young people to find the best ways to serve their country and to give back and pay it forward. Now. Look, I don't, I don't blame, uh, you're such a <laughs> slut. I don't blame um, young people for feeling that way, right? Even the people serving in Congress feel that way. We are seeing a record number of retirements uh, of, of, of incumbents. That's you know, uh, unheard of, and I think it's because it's become so dysfunctional, it's become um, so theatrical, more than, uh, more than achieving legislation, it's about how do I make a name for myself by being ridiculous and outrageous. It's uh, becoming so polarized. I mean, we remember times, you know, when, uh, when Democrats and Republicans in Congress used to be friends. I remember John McCain and Ted Kennedy being the closest of friends. Um, and so, you know, all of those things have changed and I think they've chipped away at young people feeling that they can make a difference and that this is something that they wanna do with their life. And we've gotta, we've gotta figure out ways to reverse that because frankly, the generation that's there now has really screwed things up and so we've gotta depend on the young people to make things better, to be less concerned about labels to be less concerned about partisanship and be more concerned about country and patriotism. My, my last question before we open it up is to your present roles as political analysts on television and now with all news networks and political talk shows all over the radio, what do you see as your influence or your role in the political process as television commentators? I came to my role uh, as a TV pundit. I'm not a journalist. I don't have a degree in journalism. I don't even have a degree in political science. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, What's your degree in? Industrial psychology. I, I was trying to be an engineer, industrial psychologist, industrial engineer, and I just fell into politics because I like combat. <laughs> I like winning. I, I'm a team player. I, I love how there's a community when you're involved in campaigns and politics. So when I was called to do um, CNN back in uh, November 2001, I was truly nervous. Back then, I only had, I had to work on one day, that was Friday, with Andy Borowitz um, uh, and, and a young man uh, from the National Review. And I used to say, oh God, I'm, I'm stuck between a comedian and a right-wing commentator. I didn't know my role, but I grew into the job. And I've, you know how I grew into the job? I said, oh my God, that's a camera. And I'm like, whoa, who's looking at me? One, my dad, because he would tell my sister, tell Donna to move away from the table. <laughs> or, you know, so I knew my relatives were watching me, but then I came up with this notion that there were people in Kansas and Nebraska watching me. 
And I, I didn't want it to sound like a, a Southern hillbilly or East Coast elitist. So I decided to really focus on knowing the issues, the topics, whether it was in politics or if the Pope passed away, Ronald Reagan passed away, and I'm like, damn, every time I'm on TV, somebody dies. <laughs> I, had, I mean, I had Michael Jackson. I, I, I missed uh, Whitney Houston by uh, just a moment. Uh, but then I had a comedian, and I had uh, Mr. Goldberg from the National Review. And I, I learned. It took years to harness my skills so that I could make it to prime time. And then I could make it to Sunday shows. I could sit next to George Will. And George Will would sit there and start quoting Hamilton. <laughs> and the Federalist Papers and Madison. I'm like, out, is he out of his mind? I wanted to quote Tupac. <laughs> I mean, I don't know nothing about these guys. But I went back and I started reading the Federalist Papers. So I knew the politics. Of course, I knew all of the political stories, like I knew all of everything about football and basketball and major league uh, sports in general. But I had to learn some of the fundamentals. And by my fifth anniversary on television, I had not only succeeded in being on at any hour, any day of the week, but also got a network. So I expanded my vision from, I'm not just talking to people in Nebraska and Kansas. I'm talking to America. And I better sound like I make sense and that I can understand their lives and their concerns as well as defend the people and the institutions that I know. It's been the greatest joy and honor to, to not only being a CNN, ABC News, Fox News, I've done a little bit of M MSNBC, PBS, NPR, I've been a radio person, I've written syndicated columns, I write now for USA Today, The Hill, I'm still the kid who grew up who wanted to do something with my life, who wanted to stir the pots, change the world. And while I haven't been able to change every doggone thing that I set out to do when I wrote in my, my diary to God, because I didn't trust the priest. <laughs> That's all right, he's dead and I still pray for him. <laughs> but I did say to God, dear God, if, if I, if you would allow me one day to work on presidential campaigns. I will stand up for the poor. I will never forget the least of these. I will use whatever power or access I had to help those in need. And that was what I prayed for. And I'm grateful to God that I've had that opportunity, especially during Hurricane Katrina when I could go on national TV and say to America, there are still people, there are still people who need to be rescued, including my sister who is disabled. She needs help. Somebody have to go and get her. She can't leave. And then two weeks later, I did something else. I wrote a column in the Washington Post. I said, dear Mr. President, George Bush, I don't care what people are calling you. Hurricane Katrina was an equal opportunity to destroy. She killed black people and white people and anybody in her way. Mr. President, I did not vote for you. I did not work for you. I work for Al Gore, but I want to help you. That was the moment when I learned humility and grace. And I'm grateful every time I go back to my beloved hometown that George W. Bush gave me that opportunity because we are rebuilding the levees. We are clearly, the schools are back open. The libraries are reopened. The saints are back home. But we have a level one trauma center. We never had that before. Charity Hospital, where I was born, was decimated. And because of George W. Bush, and clearly Barack Obama who followed, we have healthcare facilities. And my daddy told me, he said, he said, go back and talk to the president. I said, oh, come on. I'm done with this. I've been talking to Republicans now for three consecutive years. I want to see some Democrats. He said, before you see some Democrats, go get a new VA center. I said, oh my God, he got to stop drinking old Milwaukee best. <laughs> and you know what I did?
Just like the Bible say, honor thy mother and father. I went to the president, Ed Gillespie, Carl Rove said, that's enough, Donna. Carl Rove will tell you I'm the most expensive date they ever came through the White House. <laughs> we got a VA center, folks. So I have no regrets. I love my work, and when my days are over with TV commentating and writing, I'll still be doing something to look at the people of America and let you know what's going on. So thank you all for allowing us to be here, too. Well, you know, for me, I got um, on TV. I had been part of local campaigns, state campaigns, the national campaigns. And when you're doing that, when you're a, a campaign operative like that and involved, you, you become a media surrogate. So I would do interviews first in local radio, local TV, then um, national uh, with John McCain. That was, that was my opening. And after John McCain lost, they kept calling me. The networks kept calling me to come on. And at first, it's, it's very flattering, right? You get hair and makeup and false eyelashes and your mom's friends see you and all of these things. So that's very flattering. Uh, but then you realize, you know, this is taking up a lot of time. And I'm not going to do this for free. I can't continue doing this for free. And so I told CNN, if you want uh, me to co keep coming on, you've got to pay me. And to my shock, they did. <laughs> which is a, a big lesson, right? People will uh, let you do things for free as long as you let them do, as you let them have you do things for free. So if you think you're having value added, ask and demand for what you think you're worth. And so that's how my career on CNN begun. And I, you know, it never occurred to me that I would ever be on TV. I'm like, you know, chubby refugee girl from Nicaragua with an accent. People like me don't get uh, on TV. And that was part of the motivation. And it's also part of the, the weight that I think we both carry, the weight of representation. When we got on TV, listen, it wasn't until Barbara Walters came around that there was a woman co-anchor of a news show. It wasn't until Barbara Walters invented it 27 years ago that there was a panel show of women discussing politics and current affairs. Now there's a bunch of imposters, but, we're, but <laughs> it's okay, we're still number one. And so it's that weight of representation. When we first uh, got on TV, if there was one black person on a panel, there wasn't gonna be two black people. Yes. And if there was one black person on a panel, there probably wasn't gonna be a Latino. And so, that has changed. There's been progress uh, made. And I think it matters. I think it matters to little kids. To I, I can't tell you the amount of times that I get stopped at airports, at supermarkets, at gas stations, and told by young Latinas how much it means to them to see somebody who looks like them and sounds like them on TV. I do think that representation matters. I think that, that for uh, little kids seeing a, a Sonia Sotomayor or a Katanji uh, matters. It tells you when you see it, you realize that it can be real, that you too can aspire to that and you too can uh, achieve that. When we were growing up, that didn't exist. There, there wasn't a black woman in the Supreme Court. There certainly wasn't a black woman in the vice president's mansion. There wasn't a Latina on the Supreme Court. So those are, you know, I think um, all good things that have happened. For me, what's really important if, you know, I wake up thinking about every day is I don't want people, I don't want Americans, and I, don't, I myself don't want to ever become numb to what's going on. I think that's one of the biggest dangers that we face, where we become numb to the scandals, we become numb to the fraud, we become numb, numb to the lies, we become numb to the dysfunction, we become numb to the partisanship. I don't want to become numb to all of that. I still want to be outraged. I still want to be angry. I want to channel that into, into a movement. I want to motivate people to feel, to feel, you know, have a reaction to what's going on in this country, to have hope. And uh, that's what gets me up 
in the in the morning and I you know and I think it's brought so much to my life I think one of the other dangers that we face is that too often we are around people who look like us and think like us and read the same things that we do and so for me being on on CNN enabled me to become friends with a black woman from the south who I probably wouldn't have known but for that kind of, and the, and the diversity, it's you know allowed me to learn from her, and it's allowed me to share my story with her, and frankly, that allows us to share our stories with America, and to learn from America, right? And so, um, it's, it's, it's been a wonderful experience, and what I do hope is, is that, that I help America not get numb to the, bad things happening and fight against them. Thank you. Thank you. We, we have some time for a couple questions. And uh, if you raise your hand, the runners will bring a microphone to you. Don't run like Oprah. <laughs> My first. Hi. Whoa. <laughs> Uh, first of all, Anna, I really enjoy you on The View. I watch it almost every day, now that I'm retired. Wait, wait, wait. And uh, you're I'm, a joy. I'm, I'm, I'm heading back uh, at 6 in the morning to be there on, to be on tomorrow. <laughs> well, thank you for that, because you you've got a great sense of humor, and you always contribute something valuable, at least in my opinion. But I think it's, it's a really good mix. So thank you for that. And obviously, Donna, you're, you're iconic. So thank you both. Thank you. Uh, my question um, get, slash comment is, uh, you have commented on a couple things, uh, and I took notes because I didn't want to mess this up. Uh, super PACs and youth and why they're not involved. I think, it's my personal opinion, that youth are, not, are discouraged by the big money controlling, corp you know, corporations controlling through super PACs, these um, candidates. And I'm wondering, what have, whatever happened to uh, campaign finance reform and term limits? You know, why aren't why aren't we working toward that? There was, like you mentioned, R Russ Feingold. I think him and John McCain, if I remember right, years mm -hmm. ago, tried to do that. What's going on? Why can't we get, make that happen again? It's like any other change. We, we're going to have to become stronger advocates for the positions that we're taking. And whether it's campaign finance reform, look, I, I, I don't believe uh, you need in, in excess of $2 billion to run ads in seven states. Seriously. And it's not like they're paying campaign workers a hell of a lot of money. Uh, so yeah, we could use a, a healthy dose of campaign finance, public financing, especially for judicial positions and some other uh, important uh, races. But these are conversations that we should have as Americans so that we can become stronger advocates and support the organizations who are out there uh, fighting for those those very principles. I would support it. I continue to support it. I want to end all of this gerrymandering. It's just sickening. I mean, my home state, my home state of Louisiana, which is about a third African American, has only one representative because the way they gerrymander it. It's like, we better, we better grab everybody right there in New Orleans and then go on up the Mississippi River, pick up a few here, pick, pick up a few there, go to Baton Rouge and call it a day. It's, it's, it's the worst gerrymandering. And now we have a group of voters who's saying that if we create two districts that will likely be represented by, uh, say, a black or maybe a Hispanic or who knows, a white member, for years, I was represented by Lindy Boggs, and ain't nobody black in New Orleans say the damn thing, because they love Lindy. They call her Miss Lindy, okay, because she was good to everybody, kind. But now there are voters who are saying, we shouldn't have that kind of representation. This dark money is a real, huge, colossal problem in the United States. I mean, I'm, I don't have anything against billionaires, unless I win the lotto ticket and I might, okay. I don't have anything against billionaires, but when they're using their money, which they have every right to, and I'm not just speaking of billionaires on the left, I'm speaking of billionaires on the right, if they're using their money to divide us and to keep us from making progress, yeah, there should be a limit on just how much money you can throw into the cesspool, because what they're, it's not a swamp, by the way, y'all. DC is not a swamp. 
I live in D.C. and I'm from New Orleans. It's not a swamp. There are no alligators there. Okay, the mosquitoes are not the size of your toe. It's, it's a cesspool. But they are just pouring money to keep us divided. What good is that? Yeah, but you know, the problem is, same as with the voting laws, right, on the states, that the people who make the laws are thinking about how do we benefit. And so incumbents benefit from super PACs because the corporations give, them, give those incumbents money. Incumbents benefit from uh, not having term limits so they can be uh, decrepit. I mean, talk about fitness for service. Have you seen the Senate? I mean, for a while there, I thought Mitch McConnell was dead. No. <laughs> just but, taking know, a so nap. It's, it's, he's just napping. He's, I mean, no, it's a weekend that Mitch is. But the, uh, you know, so, you know, but they, they benefit from there being no term limits so that they can be there for 40 years. They benefit from gerrymandering so that they can keep, they can make it easier for their elections and make sure that they have the most amount of voters to you know, ensure their longevity in office. And so that's the huge problem we have, that the people making these laws are thinking about how do we benefit? What's best for me, not for the country? And until we as voters demand differently, until we say to somebody, okay, you have got to commit that you're only going to serve eight years, you're only going to serve, you know, until we do those things, it's not going to change. But you know what? You, you do it where you live, where you work, where you play, and you, you got to begin organizing. It always starts. Remember, it starts with you. Every change that you wish to see, everything that you want to happen, you have to be the leader of that change. So it starts with you, my friend. And you can do it. Go online. There are groups all over this country fighting for campaign finance reform. If you, DonnaBrazil.com, if I find you, I'll send you some of these organizations. Well, okay? you know, so, some ways to do it um, happening in some states, including Florida, is okay, they're not gonna pass the laws, we're going to gather signatures and we're going to put it as a constitutional amendment to vote, right? We're, so in Florida this uh, November, we have, we, we gathered enough signatures and they just approved it, the Supreme Court approved in Florida approved, there's going to be an amendment on abortion and there's going to be an amendment on recreational pot. So it's gonna be fun in Florida. <laughs> It is uh, getting late. I think one more question. You heard she has we to be on tomorrow. We have a lady tomorrow. over here. Uh, Can I? We'll take these uh, last uh, two since they have microphones. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's gentlemen right down there. Right oh, there's another one. Okay. Well, uh, I'll keep my answers brief. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that dog will come back over here. Trust me. Um, thank you both so much for coming to see us. It's this was fabulous. Um, and we can track our ballots, our absentee ballots in Wisconsin. You can find out that they're back safely at the clerk. Um, so that's Good. exciting. What, as you know, the, we've had several elections recently where the winner of the popular vote did not win the election because of the Electoral College. And then, then there's always a big hoopla about we should get rid of the Electoral College. Do you think that is a thing that is actually going to happen? and we might have elections that are based purely on the popular vote? We, th so f this debate has started again after 2016. Um, we've had this debate before. We had it after 2000. This is five times. I don't think we're going to get rid of the 12th Amendment to the Constitution without a major organizing campaign. There's a national popular compact that's gaining theme, uh, steam across the country. And if there are to be changes, then I think it would have to come through that compact, which has already started across the country. To be brief, no. I don't think the Electoral College is going to change. I don't. Hi. 
I could hear you. Okay, I just want to make sure. Um, so, I, yes, thank you both for coming. This has been wonderful tonight. Um, but my question is, uh, because you both talked a lot about um, ballot access and making um, investing in our elections a priority, um, what are your thoughts and concerns, if any, about banning private funds for administering elections, um, something that was on the ballot here this spring in Wisconsin? Banning private yeah, funds? From yeah, in, two, in 2020, especially in light of what was going on with COVID, um, and also in light of what has happened since the gutting of the Voting Rights Act, um, several foundations, Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, many, many others contributed to helping, um, helping train election workers, helping to provide uh, facilities for election administrator and polling places. There were private funds used because the public, there was no public funds available. There was no allocation. And now there's a campaign, look, this is how it works. If there's a playbook that shows that one side can get out more voters than the other side, if the other side can't replicate it, then they'll destroy the, the, what the other side is doing. That's an old playbook which is happening all over the country. And so this new campaign is to ban private donations from foundations and wealthy individuals who basically are providing their resources because the government is not providing those resources. Now that we just, in this last budget agreement, $50 million was included. That's not enough. 50 million wouldn't cover two big states, let alone all of these so-called battleground states. So I wouldn't ban it until we can get the, the money from the government or from government officials. In Wisconsin, you all just had the initiative, right? Did it pass? Yeah, of course. That's how I got money. They 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 running with this lie. It's a it's a hell of a lie. I mean, how are you gonna tell people, you know, because of the voting rights protection, um, for from 1965 until 2013, we don't need it anymore. And now, if you live in a rural area in certain parts of the South, the 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 closest polling station is 50 miles away. And so this money was to provide resources so the closest polling station is five miles away or five blocks away. I mean, they weren't running the, the actual election, they were just providing the resources so that you can bring the vote to the people in states that did not allow absentee ballots. Unless you had an excuse, well, I'm in the hospital. What if I'm in college? Or what if my job has called me to go somewhere for two weeks. Can I just, no. So yeah, this is all bullshit. <laughs> and it's intended for one reason and one reason only, and that is to stop people from participating in the electoral process, which is that's your voice being taken away from you, and you should speak up angrily, and you should continue to educate people about why we need help in running our elections, and why we need volunteers. Don't be afraid to stand up for justice, for freedom, and for fairness. That's the American way, and you should be a part of it. We had another question. I forgot it was, uh, oh, okay. I'm you know sorry. you said you were going to be brief. <laughs> you know, the closer we get to the midnight hour, I'll get warmed up. We got, we got one. Baby, I get warmed up, baby. Ain't nothing going to turn my channel off. Unless I go home and watch HGTV. Y'all know that's adult porn. <laughs> They're always stripping something to the stud. I get so excited every time I turn on HGTV. Okay, what's the next question? <laughs> I want to I want to ask this in a very constructive way. Right. It's for you, Anna. Um, I feel like I have a lot of conversations with Republicans. I'm not a Republican, but I have a lot of conversations with Republicans that go a lot like this did tonight, where you and Donna seem to agree on so many things, and yet the party has been so thoroughly hijacked, and we never see elected Republicans, except for in very rare instances, um, stand up to Donald Trump and uh, resist the takeover of the party. Now it seems so thorough that we're looking at a train wreck in slow motion that's coming at us in November. 
So I guess I'm, the, my question is, what can members of the GOP do or should do <clears throat> to help us all avoid uh, the catastrophe of democracy that we know is very possible Look, if elected, we elected again. members are not going to stand up because Donald Trump has shown that he, uh, Donald show, Trump has told us he believes in retribution, he believes in vendettas, he exerts power, right? He will reach his hand and influence a local race, a, a race for county commission if somebody stood up against him. Ask Liz Cheney. I mean, if he, if he could bring a Cheney down in Wyoming, imagine what it means for everybody else. And I think, you know, I think he's, um, anybody who stood up against Donald Trump has either lost primaries, lost generals, um, lost their leadership position, like Liz, retired because they knew they couldn't win, or died, like John McCain. And so it's lesser and lesser voices that are actually standing up against them. So it's not gonna be elected officials because they're all about self-preservation. And none of them wanna cross a man who can take them down in an election. It's going to be up to voters. It's part of the reason why I'm still a Republican. Because I want to be able to vote in primaries. I want to be able to piss from within <laughs> the tent and look at people and say, you know, you've sold out on your principles. I mean, how can you, how can you possibly lecture me as a Christian evangelical? when you are voting for a man who cheated on his first wife with the second, on the second with the third, and on the third with a Playboy bunny and a stripper, who he then paid hush money to. And then you're going to lecture me about Christianity? I, I mean, you know, have you, I, mean, I just, you know, you, so I, I, I like the idea of being able to look at them as a member of the party and call out the hypocrisy and the insanity. And so, you know, I, I would say um, supporting folks like Liz Cheney, supporting folks like uh, Mitt Romney, speaking out from within the party and saying these are not Republican principles. This is a party that doesn't have a platform because what it is is, a, is, is, is uh, an ode to one man. I will be frank with you. At first, you know, I, I hoped that um, that if Trump lost the election, the fever would break. It didn't. It didn't break. He didn't go away. Uh, I would tell you the fever has gotten worse. And he's and, and the problem and it's and even if he loses again, I still don't think the fever breaks for a bit. It's going to. At some point, there's going to be a uh, different Republican Party again. But it's not going to be uh, it's not going to be immediately, and it's not going to be short term because there's been way too many candidates, Republicans uh, elected, who are like him, who think the the success lies in in being a Marjorie Taylor Greene, and being a Matt Gates, and being a Ron DeSantis, and being so they're they're you know more Catholic than the Pope now. They're more Trumpist than Trump. On, uh, on things, so it's gonna take a while, but in politics, as you well know, it's a pendulum. And when things swing too far one way, they eventually will come back. It's gonna take a while, though. It's going to take a while for the fever to break. I wanna thank our... Thank you. I thank was gonna, you for having I was gonna say thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And thank you to the Tommy Thompson Center and to the university administrators and everyone who put this together. And, and make sure your young people in this Please. state go out and vote. Get your children, your grandchildren, everybody. Don't feed them if they don't vote. And we do hope to continue this series and I hope you'll come back. Thank you. Thank you.